Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade, Max Wilbert. On this urgent episode of The Green Flame, Lierre Keith comments on a new development in the war on women. That development is Biden's executive order on gender identity, an order signed the day of his inauguration, and it will eviscerate women's rights. Lierre Keith is the founder of the Women's Liberation Front, Wolf. She is a Wolf board member, a radical feminist for over 40 years, and is the author of six books, including the novels Skylar Gabriel, Conditions of War, and The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability. We're recording now. Thank you so much, Lierre, for joining us for this um, very urgent um, green flame that we will be getting out as soon as possible. It is the 22nd, and yesterday, Biden exec... Two days ago. Two days ago now. Okay, he did two it on days the day ago. of the inauguration. Oh, my gosh, He wasn't that's even right. president five hours. Yeah, he five did it immediately. Hours. Five hours. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. So five hours into his presidency, he issued an executive order that um, begins to initiate some of the Equality Act um, Mm -hmm. and and completely circumvents uh, the legislative kind of procedure around um, Mm -hmm. those kind of laws. Please explain this to us. What does an executive order do and what did this one do? Okay, so executive orders are legal. They have been ruled legal by the Supreme Court a long time ago, 100 years ago, long time. This is a feature now of um, the powers that the president has, that the executive branch holds. Um, And they can be very controversial. Um, I mean, the way that the government is set up in the United States, we're supposed to have three branches of government. So we have the executive, we have the legislative, and then we have the Supreme Court, the judicial branch. And they're supposed to work, you know, checks and balances. We all learned this in first grade, right? Um, And the legislature is supposed to make the law. It's literally what legislature means. That's their job. And the president isn't really supposed to make the law. That's not what he does or she does. Um, So, you know, of course they find workarounds. That's what power does. So many, many presidents have done executive orders and they pretty much have all done it for a hundred years. Like very famously Truman, President Truman desegregated the U.S. military using an executive order. So that's I mean, as far as the military goes, that's for good. It, you know, he just declared that there was not going to be segregation anymore in the armed forces. And, you know, a year or two later, it was done. I mean, it's just what the, the military, they know how to follow orders and they did it. So that was the first major U.S. institution that was desegregated and it went very smoothly. Um, and before you know it, black people were ordering white people around and nobody thought anything of it because it was the military. Um, so, you know, there's reasons sometimes that they do this, but you know, the, the downside is that it does circumvent the, the democratic process. We have a way to pass laws in this country and this is not it. So especially when you're taking on something that is bound to be controversial, um, that's going to change a whole bunch of stuff for a whole bunch of people, you want that to happen in the light of day. So every president, you know, does this. And then the other side always says, well, this is you know, it's, oh, it's executive overreach, it's this, it's that. Um, I mean, this is there's always contentious things that happen. So I'm not blaming any particular president because like I said, they all do it. Um, this isn't like a new evil thing that Biden came up with. Um, but, you know, obviously this is one that, that women are, we're gonna be hurting from this one. So the, the promise was that they were gonna pass this piece of legislation that was called the Equality Act. And that at least would have gone through the proper channels. If it had been in Congress, Senate, the House representatives, there would have been debate. We all would have had um, time to, you know, present our view on it, the way that laws are supposed to be passed, and and they they didn't do that. So we've got this instead. Um, all right. So what does the executive order actually say? Well, it's fairly short. Um, you can read it. It's online. It's been posted up. You can go to the White House website and look at it. Um, and it it so it starts with a decision that happened last year from the Supreme Court that was called the Bostock decision. Now the Bostock decision was three separate cases that were collapsed into one. Um, And part of it ruled that uh, gay and lesbian Americans could not be discriminated against uh, 
due to sexual orientation. And that's fine. Nobody has a problem with that. The problem was this other case, the Amy Stevens case. And this was a man who decided he was a woman one day. And instead of, so, I mean, this could have gone two ways. You could have a man who says, I would prefer to wear the women's professional clothes to work instead of the men's clothes. I'm a man, but I want to wear these clothes. That would be a very different argument. And that was not what Amy Stevens argued. He argued that he was a woman and therefore he should be wearing the women's uniform. And he worked at a funeral home. The funeral home really didn't like this. I mean, you've got people coming who, uh, you know, are in the worst grief of their lives. And this was just not something that they wanted anybody to have to deal with. Um, and from a feminist perspective, I mean, it's just very simple. Men cannot be women. So um, clothing in the United States uh, for employment purposes, they are legally allowed to have separate dress codes for men and women. That's, I think, a problem. Um, but he's not addressing that problem. He's not saying, well, we shouldn't have, you know, separate dress codes. The, I think that women could certainly make that argument. But the the courts have ruled that that's legal as long as it doesn't put an undue burden on anybody. So as long as they're, you know, cost basically the same and, you know, whatever, don't do this or that, you're, you're, you're allowed to have those still in the United States. It's not illegal to have a separate dress code. Um, and so instead of trying to address that to say, actually, anybody should be able to wear professional clothes in a professional environment, um, he instead argued, no, I'm a woman. And the, the real kicker here is that he demanded access to the women's bathroom. So you know, the, his employer said no. So that was what the case was about. And the Supreme Court ruled that um, that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is really all we have in the United States to protect, um, you know, a whole bunch of our, of our civil rights, um, they, they ruled that that should include gender identity. And this is a disaster for women. Um, in 1964, this didn't exist as a concept. Um, gender identity was certainly not included under the category of sex. The people who wrote that legislation certainly didn't intend that in any way. There's no evidence that they did. Um, and it has protected women. Women have used the Civil Rights Act more than any other group in the United States. And there's a lot of interesting history there, but we don't really have time to get into it. Um, but anyway, the Civil Rights Act is pretty much what we've got. The Bill of Rights that we have, there are a series of uh, what are called negative freedoms. So you know, we all think of the Bill of Rights and it's like, okay, the First Amendment and the you know, the Second Amendment, and they're all, it's, it's, these are laws that restrict the reach of the federal government. So we don't actually have a proactive right to speech under the First Amendment. What we have is a right not to be interfered with. So the government shall make no laws. And that's what the First Ten Amendments really are about, is trying to keep the government out of, you know, what are, people's sort of natural human rights. Um, and if you look back in history, what you had at the founding of this country and, and then the next 10 years is, you know, you've got the rising mercantile class and what they're fighting is essentially um, an older system, which involved a king, <laughs> so hereditary uh, power. And instead the rising mercantile class was fighting them and saying, no, but we have rights and we don't want you to rule over us. We're going to rule over ourselves. So what you had was a, a bunch of very rich, essentially white men saying, I won't interfere with you. You don't interfere with me. And we're going to call that freedom. Now, as far as that goes, it's certainly been helpful. I'm glad we have a First Amendment, but that's as far as it ever went. Um, and so it's not really you get to like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That's like stuck onto this document with spit in a prayer. So we've got all kinds of like bigger structural problems going on behind the scenes about why this will or will not work for women. Um, regardless, here we are today. So what Biden has done has said, taking this Bostock decision, um, so instead of sex, we're now gonna have gender identity. So every place in the law that was protecting women as a group, as, as you know, a class based on our biology, um, now they're going to instead look at that through the eyes of, quote, gender identity. So, and they can't define gender identity. It's not in this executive order. There's literally no definition. And the few states that have tried to have definitions, I mean, in New Jersey, it's like the, a gender identity is a gender-related identity, and I'm not making that up. It's completely circular. And this is because it's complete nonsense. And I know we all keep using 
the emperor's new clothes as our big metaphor, but I don't have a better one. It's just complete nonsense. Like it means nothing. Uh, yeah, a circle is a thing we call a circle. Great. Does not tell you what a circle is. And the most ridiculous thing is that I, we all know what a man is and what a woman is. This isn't actually up for debate. We have been a sexually dimorphic 500 million years on this planet. We've had sexual reproduction. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's men and there's women. This is actually not very complicated. They have made it complicated. It is not complicated. We all know who can bear the babies and who doesn't. So, and, and you know, for the whole history of patriarchy, they've never had a problem figuring out who the women were, who was gonna be sold as a child bride, who was gonna have her genitals mutilated, who was gonna have her feet bound, who wasn't allowed to vote. I mean, in 1976, when my mother divorced my father, she couldn't get a credit card in her name. She couldn't get a bank account. Didn't happen to my father. We all know who that happened to and why we have a feminist movement. Anyway, so Bostock has now come to fruition. We saw this in the ruling. Anybody can read it. All this information is, is public. Um, and that's what they said was that it, yes, gender identity was essentially a discrete group of people and they deserve protection and we're just gonna go with it. They, again, never defined it because it's not definable. It's simply an internal feeling and it has nothing to do with physical reality. So um, this executive order, um, <sighs> all right. So uh, uh, all of the federal anti-discrimination statutes that cover sex discrimination um, now have to provide um, the same, uh, a, some, a way to say that this is, they're gonna prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity. So this involves all the federal civil rights offices across the, the country are now gonna have to enforce this. Um, this is where you used to go if you felt like there was workplace discrimination or something. Um, that was one of the legal remedies that you had. So women aren't going to have that remedy anymore. Um, men will. Yeah, that was definitely my my question: is what does this do to United States women immediately? Yeah, um, uh, and so um, you can't go there. Well, I mean, you can try, but the problem is we are now that we are now going to be the people who um, are the problem, right? men are gonna come and say, women aren't letting me do X, Y, and Z. I'm not allowed in the women's bathroom. I'm not allowed to take a woman's you know, job that's been reserved for women um, and that's discrimination. So women are gonna have to give way. We are now the problem that has to be solved rather than the people who are being hurt, systematically hurt. It's, it's completely the opposite now. We are the, the boundary that has to be broken. So this is every federal agency. They've been directed to do comprehensive assessment of all their regulations and they have a hundred days to plan how they are going to now insert uh, gender identity in the place of sex, um, how they're gonna interpret all this through the lens of gender identity. So this includes all American employers, it includes all the institutions and indeed eventually all the individuals. Um, so you think about all the federal agencies, well that immediately includes housing and urban development, HUD, and they are the people who run all the, you know, all the not the religious homeless shelters, but all the public homeless shelters. So now you've got an incredibly vulnerable group of women who are not gonna be able to keep men out. And there have already been cases where women have been sexually assaulted in homeless shelters. Um, there's a case that's still ongoing from Sacramento, California, where, I mean, thank God women were able to find a lawyer, but they have terrible experiences of how a man was forced into the homeless shelter with them and they had to shower and share rooms with him and how terrifying this was and the things he did to them. Um, the bad and of course, of yeah, course I mean, prisons, prisons, <laughs> any federal prison. Yes, all the prisons now. And we, again, there's already cases rolling. There's Illinois, there's Texas, there's Washington. Women, I just want everybody to feel the horror of this. You are a woman locked in a 10 by 10 cell. And now we have a man who's very likely a violent offender, could be a sexual offender, is now put in your cell with you. You have literally no way to escape. And this is what they're going to do to women around the country now. They're already doing it. We haven't been able to get any press about it. Um, in England, I mean, in, in the UK, they had, you know, Mr. Karen White, who insisted he was a woman and was put in a woman's prison. And he, he sexually assaulted women. And it was all over the news. And it really helped them in their fight against, you know, their version of what, you know, what was going on there. Um, but it, it broke through into the mainstream. We have not been able to do that here. Um, and we have just as many horrifying cases here and nobody wants to hear it. The, the, 
the press, it's just the great, the great wall of silence at this point, what's happening to the most vulnerable women. We know why women end up in prison. We know the rates that they have been abused as children, battered as adults, that they're in for economic crimes because they're living in poverty. Um, a lot of them are survivors of prostitution. Like they're, they're the women who have been hurt the most by this system. And now they're going to be locked in cells with, with men, with male predators. And it's just, my mind just, I, and the left, is, this is who's pushing this, is the Democrats who are supposed to be, you know, the side that's anti-racist and the side that's for progress and the side that's for, you know, unity and all that. And that's who's bringing this. It wasn't the Republicans who did this to women. So and yes, then the to up the go, horror level as well. I mean, what does this do to children in school oh, systems? The schools. So that's the next thing. Is well, what how does the how does you know the federal level of control and this executive order? That's one of the most horrifying aspects to me about replacing well, gender identity with sex. Fire the entire public school system. So anybody who gets federal money is going to have to immediately, you know, give into this. So it's every school girl is now not going to have a, a public bath, a, a bathroom that she can use in school safely. And hang on one second. This is my dog. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Yeah. Um, I don't know why she thinks we're in danger. We're not in any danger. Um, uh, actually, yeah, so, I think that it's in our voices. We are in danger. Yeah, we <laughs> we know, really, we really are. She knows she's got she, she sensible animal instincts. Yeah. If you'd like to repeat that, because um, we had the barking is, in the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is every single public school. This is the, I mean, that's where the federal money goes. A private school, if you're not getting federal money, you might not have to, you know, give into this right away, but all the public schools are going to have to do it. So, um, and, you know, you can talk to any human rights group around the world and they will tell you the number one thing that keeps girls in school, that keeps girls out of school is uh, lack of safe toileting facilities. This is a huge human rights issue in poorer countries. Um, it's true when girls are very young, but the, especially when they start to get their periods, when they hit adolescence, um, it's over. Girls just drop out in droves because they don't have a safe place to attend to their, their menstrual needs. And um, for some reason, we're just gonna decide that girls in the United States don't need this, that girls in India need it, and girls in Sri Lanka need it, and you know, girls in Iran need it, but, uh, and girls in, you know, the Congo need it, but girls in the United States, somehow it's different. We have a different kind of man and boy here who would never hurt women and girls. And women are perfectly fine to just drop their clothes and pee wherever they want. We all know this is not true. We all know that it is exactly the same here, that we deal with predators every day as women and girls. Um, so we've already got stories of the girls who won't pee all day long at school and are getting bladder infections and nobody cares. <laughs> And then also, I know that there was some headway, at least I thought, around the issue of women's sports and girls' sports in schools being totally um, eliminated because of this. Um, There's been pushed back. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, that's an issue that has gotten more coverage. It's gotten just a little bit. We've got a little more purchase on that one. I'm not sure why the sports one. I don't care. I mean, it's just take an issue and like move. Um, yeah, there's the big cases in Connecticut, but the, there's the three, the three girls, the high school girls who are on the track team. And of course a boy joined and they just say, there's no point in running. I mean, it, they, it's it. I mean, he just can beat them by a mile. So it, we all know this about men and women. We have different bodies. Women have a bigger pelvis. It takes a half a second more every time we walk just to take a step because we're kind of making a right hand turn there, a right angle. And uh, there's just no way that women are ever going to run as fast as men. And you can see the fastest women in the world are just barely up to kind of mediocre men. I mean, I remember when the I mean, we had this amazing women's soccer team in the United States that went to the Olympics and they played a game against high school boys and they lost. These are the best women in the world. And it's just we have physical differences, but the lung size. Um, the oxygenation, uh, the heart size, the muscle, muscle size, the strength of the joints, just down the list. We all know that men and women have different bodies. Infants are born with a template. They can tell the difference between a male and a female face. We all can do this. I, I don't know why they have made this so complicated. Well, I do know why, but I don't know why everybody's falling for it is what I don't know. Um, so, okay. So, okay. We've got the, the prisons the housing, the battered women's shelters. Can you imagine being a battered woman escaping your batterer? And now he can say, oh, I'm a woman. 
take me into the shelter. You think men aren't going to do that? You've ever dealt with a stalker, a batterer? Oh, they're going to do it. We know what these men are like. They're going to do it. So that's going to happen. And now the schools, so it's every girl in the nation is not going to have a safe place and we're going to lose the sports. Um, so it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a grim, it's a grim day. I mean, Trump was a nightmare. And I think we're all glad he was gone. He's gone. It, I mean, he, he did a lot to hurt this country and to really sort of degrade our democratic processes such as they are. But, uh, it just went from one to the other, like, and we knew this was coming. Biden had promised it, and he did and the, it. So, and the left is a horrible nightmare in the war against it is women. Yeah, an absolute nightmare. And, and a, there's a, I don't know if you ever follow the, you know, different sort of public intellectuals, but there's this guy Eric Weinstein, who's a, he's very smart, he's an interesting guy, but he he has this his the way that he encapsulates it on one hand, you know, the MAGA make America great again, the little hats. We have Magistan on one side and we have Wokistan on the other side. Oh no. That's it, right? That's so, brilliant. Man, those, those are our choices in the United States. So yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of employment law, uh, a man now can't be fired for claiming to be a woman, but a woman can be fired for pointing out that he's a man. Um, wow. There's going to be a lot of compelled, compelled speech coming down at us right now. There's it's sort of behind the scenes. You can watch these articles in the law journals and, um, you know, the lefty Wokistan people are horrified that court documents now um, don't refer to people using their preferred pronouns. So um, this has already happened in England where, you know, I don't know if you followed Maria McLaughlin's case, but she was assaulted um, by a, a man who thinks he's a woman at a, at a public talk and he punched her in the face and broke her camera and, you know, he assaulted her. And then there was a court case about it. And she was told by the judge that she had to call him her. He, she, she was compelled to use female pronouns for a man who assaulted her. So now I want you to picture you've got a rape victim in court and she's being told that she has to refer to this man as a woman. Yes. His female penis did this to me. Um, and the consequences of, of not following that compelled speech are fines. Contempt of court. You can be contempt thrown, of court. You can be thrown you, in prison. For, you can be thrown in prison. Absolutely. For not for non-compliance. And that would be me. I'm not going to comply to this, but it. You're asking the average woman to have to stand up to this while she's on trial, after the worst trauma of her life. She's going to have to refer to a man as a woman, and we're all just supposed to accept this as. I mean, my head is just kind of exploding here, and this is where we are. And you know, the outsized influence of the United States is always. This is going to go everywhere now. It's it's not just us. I mean, it's going to be around the world. So it's bad. And, then, and we can't get any public debate. We can't get any news analysis. There's no mainstream coverage of this. This has been the problem for well over a decade where we just cannot get anybody to pay attention to it. We get a little bit of right-wing coverage. That's it. But the mainstream news, they won't touch it. And it's for the same reason. It's institutional capture. They've already been captured. There are journalists terrified of losing their jobs. We hear from them all the time. Um, they know the truth of this, but they can't say it because they got mortgages to pay. So I don't know what's going to break through. Like, what's it going to take? Somebody's going to have to stand up and say, it. we're not doing this anymore. But And does that, I mean, you would think of all the places where biological reality would still hold, it would be in health and healthcare. And it's not. No, it's not. And it's and not. And the consequences of not having that, that, it, it, that's that's one of the things where my head just explodes, frankly. Yeah. So, and there's a, an even bigger problem too, which is that the as it stands, what we're going to have is whatever doctors, like healthcare providers, include insurance, but also the actual doctors and nurses uh, may well be compelled to perform these surgeries and uh, provide these really dangerous drugs um, because what. What's already been done legally is that if you, um, the argument is that if you already provide like mastectomies for women with cancer or hysterectomies for women who have uterine cancer or other, you know, PCOS or whatever conditions, endometriosis, where you might actually have a medical need to have your uterus removed. If you do those procedures, you can't make a distinction between somebody with a disease, you know, a medical problem and somebody who actually just wants it electively. You're, you're not allowed to make that distinction. If they call themselves trans, 
you then have to provide the same care, even though it's a completely different situation. There's nothing wrong with their, their bodies. Their bodies are perfectly healthy. So they're forcing doctors and nurses to have to do this and they're forcing insurance companies to have to pay for it. Um, and I, this just seems like a right of conscience things for doctors. I mean, they take an oath to do no harm. And some of these are just, they're children. I mean, we're talking about 13 year old girls having mastectomies here in California and in Oregon. That's madness. I don't, you can't drink, you can't drive, you can't vote, you can't pierce your ears, but you can have your uterus removed, your breasts chopped off. And, and we all know, it's like when you're a teenager, you're not thinking about whether you're gonna have children. No, so mm -hmm. many people who never wanted children and then they turned 28 and fell in love and then had children. They got, you know, found a partner, had a baby, and it just completely transformed their lives. It's like the most incredible experience they've ever had would do anything to protect those children. Like we know what, you know, having a baby can can bring out the kind of love that that brings out in people. And it's utterly life altering. You can't make that decision when you're 12 or 13. You can't make it when you're 17. You'd, you have no idea what's coming in your life. You're a totally different person when you're 30. Yes. And we're indeed. letting these kids just, they're, they're just saturated in, in self-hatred. The porn industry has completely taken over the culture. I have nothing but sympathy for these poor girls. I know why they hate their bodies, but they've been given the wrong story. You know, in my generation, we did anorexia and cutting. That was how we, you know, did our self-hatred. And it was for the same reasons. I mean, we'd all been molested. We were all looking at a culture that considered our bodies public property, ridiculous, insulting, you know, worthy of contempt. Um, they weren't ours to inhabit. You know, they, they belonged to men. They didn't belong to us. We all had these experiences of being harassed or, you know, groped or terrified or, you know, maybe out and out raped. And I understand, there's, there's no question why young girls feel this way as they become teenagers. You know, you hit 11, 12 years old and it's just, a completely different world walking down the street. It's terrifying. Um, and you realize you're never going to be safe again. So I get why they're doing it, but they don't have quote gender dysphoria. They have life in patriarchy. And the only solution is honestly feminism is, is a political movement that's going to change men's behavior, but they're not being told that what they're being told is that it's, you know, it's personal to them. They just happen to have a special human essence that was born in a, a sadly female body, but we can attend to that. You can take dangerous drugs. You can, you know, have these horrible surgeries and try to live, you know, un under the wire as, as a kind of a faux man. And that, and that's, that's the option out. Um, there's already a whole generation of these girls. A lot of them are lesbians. There are a lot of them are autistic. They never fit. Um, none of the roles seemed right. Well, it doesn't for most of us, but especially I think for some women, it's probably a little bit harder. Um, and you know, they're 21 years old and they've been in medical menopause for four years. They have all the problems that you get when you're 60 or 70. Um, you know, things like urinary incontinence, a 20 year old needs to deal with that. I, I just, I, I just, it's my mind. And then the surgeries they do on the young men, it just, I don't even have words. What they did to Jazz Jennings on television, millions of people watch this young man have his genitals permanently removed. And I, this was supposed to be some kind of liberatory practice. I don't, the, the yeah. hatred of the human animal here just blows my mind that and we that don't I've, protect the young. Instead, we're going to do this to them. I, it's, it's just beyond me. That blows it's, my mind as a parent too. And horrible. I've heard multiple parents with their hearts ripped out because they're watching their children be devoured by this yeah. insane culture. I know. And what is like the antithesis of being um, biocentric complete yeah. denial of basic biological reality and being eaten alive. And they're, they're, they're gutted emotionally and mentally by what's happened to their children. That's one of the most horrifying aspects of, of this gender identity piece. So and no one will help them. It's the people who should be helping us are the ones who are doing the damage. You know, like you'd think that doctors and therapists and school teachers and you know, like all these institutions that are supposed to be progressive and, and leftward leaning that are supposed to care about human rights and are supposed to care about women and children. And every last one of them has been captured. And now we have this legislation, well, it's not legislation, but we have this executive order um, that's just, you know, 
<laughs> it's just like nailing in more more nails on the coffin here for for these young people and i i'm not i am not hopeless we are not giving up we are going to fight but it is very hard this is a hard week um, so so you know wolf has done spectacular work around fighting legislation or you know working that line of being able to be politically effective in the face of this. And I know that it's really, really, really hard, but I don't know what to do with an executive order. Do you have any yeah. ideas about where we begin to fight back on that? Yeah, so executive orders are not um, free from, legisl from um, judicial oversight. They can be declared unconstitutional. Um, and the very first legal action that Wolf took was actually to try to sue the Obama administration um, over the first time that, that this happened. That was when Obama did it. At the end of his term, he went ahead and did the, this, these same executive orders where he you know, made everything be about gender identity instead. Um, and that was the first lawsuit that we filed. So we need a few things. One is a whole bunch of money because none of this comes cheap, which is sad, but it's just, it's just reality. I mean, it can be millions of dollars to, to run a lawsuit. Um, and then we need a plaintiff. You have to have somebody who was hurt by this. So it can't happen right away. We need to find somebody somewhere who can say that this executive order is somehow infringed on her her basic rights. Or it could be a man too. I mean, it's, it's gonna hurt young guys as well. So um, we need somebody to come forward and help and, and be that person in the lawsuit. And that's a big ask because we know what happens to people who put their heads up above the parapet on this issue. We know. It's, it can destroy your life rather permanently at this point, um, but it has to be done. So, I mean, we're waiting to do that. Got a bunch of other stuff sort of coming down the pipeline, but that's the main thing is that, that you know, we, we can try to fight this um, in the courts, but it, it's gonna take time. It's not gonna happen overnight. But I want people to understand another thing about this as well, which is like the reason that Obama did it, which is probably the same reason that Biden did it. Um, in the United States, People don't live here don't get how bad some of this stuff is. So first, the Supreme Court, oh God, well over 100 years ago, ruled that corporations are people. So they have the same rights as, as an actual human being would have. And then they ruled that that included the First Amendment. So they have speech rights like you and I would have. And then not that long ago, they ruled that you can't actually restrict the amount of money that people donate to political candidates because that's a form of political speech. It's a very important speech. You, you can't put, in, put, a, put any kind of line under it. So the floodgates opened and what was left of our political system was completely captured by the wealthy corporations. And I think on people's daily lives, they don't understand why things have gotten even more, like worse and worse, you know, in, in my lifetime, it has certainly happened. And that's one of the main reasons. And this is like the magic trick is done completely above board because it's not graft. It's not, um, you know, paying bribes behind the scenes. It's done completely openly and legally that the very wealthy who aren't even people, they're corporations um, are allowed to simply buy candidates. And that I'm not picking on Obama here. Every last candidate you see running has these kind of backers. It's the only way they need millions of dollars to get their candidates, you know, their candidacies up and running and to run a candidate for president. I don't even want to think how much money that costs. And the only way to do it is to get these backers. So that in, in the terms of Obama, he's from Illinois. And one of the big, the big billionaire families out there is the Pritzkers. And they're a pharmaceutical company, but I mean, this is all public information. They owned an airline, they own the Hyatt hotels, like just on and on, like the amount of you know, businesses churning money they made, um, but pharmaceuticals was huge for, for their, their wealth. And I mean, they're billionaires and they bought him his first Senate seat in Illinois. They, they put a bet on him and, and their horse won. And then they bought him his Senate seat in Washington. So then he became, you know, in, in the federal government, he was, a, he was a senator. And then they put more money on him and they got him into the White House. They're not the only ones. There certainly were other corporate interests behind it. And again, I'm not picking on him. This is how the system works. It's how the court said it should work and it's working fine for them, but this is what we're up against. So Pritzker's put him in and then it was payback time. And they also have a very um, famous member of their family 
Jennifer Pritzker, who I think was born, oh, what was his original name? I don't even remember. James, maybe. It started with a J, Jonathan. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a man who thinks he's a woman. And um, so they've got a big trans in their family. So that was the payoff when it was his second term. The two years in, he went ahead and did all these executive orders. And it was quite clearly just, that's what they wanted. So he gave it to them. That was the payoff. Um, and so is this, uh, is this a replay? Yeah, it is. With because Biden? Penny Pritzker yeah. is, was a huge backer. She actually ran the fundraising for Biden. This is public information. I am not making this up. And this is not, I just want to be really clear. This is not a crazy conspiracy. This is literally how the American political system works. Okay. This is legally how it's done. Above board, they just buy themselves candidates. And that's what they did. So we are up against billionaires. The Pritzkers are billionaires and they wanted this legislation. They wanted these executive orders. So that, and you know, <laughs> how many of us are there? A few hundred. And um, okay, here's my $10. I mean, th this is what we're fighting. And I mean, we have truth, we have righteousness, we have our love for women, we have our love for the planet. So I don't want to, you know, like instill more despair in anybody who's listening. We are not giving up. I will not surrender. And I don't think any of you will either. But this is definitely David versus, versus Goliath. And this didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, these men have been planning this for decades. You know, they had an entire plan. It's called the Yoga Carta Principles. You can see how they all got together and, you know, made a list of what their demands were going to be. And one by one, they've done it. But they're the billionaire class. They have all this money. They could do it. And a lot of people are like, where did this all come from? It dropped out of nowhere. It feels that way if you're kind of a normie. But I tell you, as someone who's been fighting this since the 80s, oh, no, it didn't drop out of nowhere. They got billions of dollars. They had a political plan. And they've gotten it done. And now here we are. And all the women and girls in the United States are going to pay the price. So that's where we are. Um, we're not going to lose. I mean, we also have truth on our side. It is simply true that men cannot become women. And no matter what kind of postmodern gobbledygook they want to put on that, it, it can't be done. Like you are the sex you are. You cannot be born in the wrong body. I just don't even, that's like a prayer as far as I'm concerned. You have one body. It's your one chance to be alive. You got to be born. Like how is that not enough just to be alive? And I understand all the things that happen to us that make our hate, hate our, our physical embodiment, but it's all we've got. It's still a miracle every morning to breathe, to wake up, take that breath of air, look at the green trees and the yellow, the sun and feel the warmth and know that you're loved and pet your dogs and hug your children and all. Like every single sensual moment of that is just a miracle. And how did we lose sight of that to the point where we're, think our bodies are Lego blocks so we can buy parts and remove them and slap them back on. It's a very poor simulacrum at best. It sounds like Mary Shelley's nightmare. It is. She was on it. She, she was knew on what it. was coming. She saw it coming. Mm -hmm. She really did. She saw the arrogance of that scientific mind and what that had to do with male domination and the, the male violation imperative. She got it all. And yeah, she, she was did. just a teenager when she wrote that book. She yep. saw it coming. She it was comes exactly to you right. in dreams. Yeah. yeah. It comes to you in dreams and it comes to you out of your heart. And yeah. um, do you have any, <sighs> that was so inspiring, Leah, in the face of such a nightmare. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with listeners about where to look? Because you're not going to stop fighting. And we want to support you. And we want to support all women everywhere in the United States that are that are going to have to grind yeah. through this and, and defeat this nightmare. So what are, where do we look? What do we look to? Um, anybody who inspires you that you'd like to leave us with? Um, a few things right away. There, we have a petition. If you go to the Wolf website, you can sign the petition. More important, write a letter. Write a letter to the Biden administration. Write a letter to Kamala Harris. <laughs> write a letter to your legislatures. Call your senators on the phone. Tell them you're upset about this explain to them what's going on and then reach out to your state legislatures too because this is going to be a state-by-state -state battle as well it's already a state-by-state -state battle you've got to get involved and i know it's terrifying i do know that it's the people who come at us really mean it they're unhinged they're violent they will destroy your life if they decide to you will lose your job you can lose your house i mean 
I, there's not a woman I know who hasn't had serious losses to this. I mean, some of us have lost our careers entirely. Um, I know people who've had to leave the country. It's, I'm not going to sugarcoat what you may be up against to come out on this one, but it has to be done. So contact every single, um, you know, anybody who represents you in any government at all from the local to the, to the federal level, reach out to them, talk to them, get your talking points ready, go with a friend. Um, they have to see you if you're a constituent. That is your right as a citizen. They have to let you come and talk to them. You may only be able to see staffers if they're big people, but um, you know, they still, they have to take your information. They have to sit and listen to you. So get yourselves together, you know, practice beforehand, but do it. We have to learn how to engage with the political process. Um, I think a lot of us who are more on the radical edge, I mean, we a lot of times we spend our lives kind of rolling our eyes at it because it just seems so reformist, but there are times and places where we have to engage. And this is definitely one of them because otherwise they win. I mean, if we don't show up to do our part, it, they're going to win because there's no there's no fight back and they have captured everything at this point and we've got to start pushing back so we've got to learn to do that go with a friend just you know put on your <laughs> your big girl shoes and just get it done and it, it's they're just people honestly i mean i've i've done it i've lobbied it's not they're just people like me and you and and they don't know more than we do either. It's especially not on this issue. And it doesn't matter whether you have Democrats or Republicans representing you. They all need to hear it. They have not heard a feminist analysis. They don't understand how this is going to hurt women and girls. Um, everybody thinks it's kind of gay plus. That's, and it's not. It's not anything like gay and lesbian rights. Nothing like it at all. So, yeah, I mean, we've just got to speak up. And then speak to everybody in your life about it. And I know that's hard. People are going to be very mad at you. But it has to be done. Whoever you are, if you're listening to this, you probably have really nice friends. You've got good family. They probably have really good hearts. They want what's best for everyone. They need to understand how this is going to hurt women and girls and that you're not helping young people who hate their bodies by letting them do permanent damage that they will regret in five years. So anyway, all of that, you know, get yourselves together. But we've got to talk to people, our friends, our family, our neighbors, and then everybody in a position of political power. Sign our petition, uh, write a letter. And if you want to join Wolf, join, because we need help. We need volunteers in every single state. This is going to be massive and it's going to take all of us. So, but never surrender. Never surrender. Never surrender. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lear, for all of that. Thank you, Jennifer. And yeah, you are so welcome. And I'm so glad that the Green Flame is going to be able to put this out there um, with such an eloquent voice. We thank you so much for taking some time because I know you are working tirelessly <laughs> for, for everybody, women well, and girls and, and, and the real world. A lot of us are. So join hands. Yeah. We got to do it. We will. This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.